Well, first of all, um, I would like to thank Dwell3 for inviting me. Uh, I think we've worked on that for a while, but never really, yeah. But finally, um, it, it, it was possible. And I'm very glad to be here, although it, it will be a very short uh, stay. I arrived after midnight today <laughs> and will fly out early morning tomorrow uh, on my way back. So duty is calling. Uh, our long Easter break in Cardiff actually will end at some point and I will have to be back. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. I'm also very pleased to actually present something that uh, is very closely linked to my work. Uh, as Dorothy already said, uh, I'm, uh, I've been working on uh, the Datang Xiyiqi, the record of the Western regions of the Great Tang. Uh, I, I don't want to. I don't want to know how long it's, it's been now. Um, and the mentioned publication. Well, uh, you may know that the whole text uh, consists of. It's a long text. Uh, it consists of twelve duen of uh, twelve fascicles. Um, and after a long kind of deliberation and uh, looking at what I had as manuscripts uh, so far, uh, it's an ongoing process still. Um, I decided, or we, my publisher and I decided that we will have 12 volumes because <laughs> each fascicle became a volume uh, of its own standing, uh, which is not due to the text itself. The text uh, and I've already translated, it is actually, and this is what went into the presentation. Um, it's uh, the commentary, which is taking a lot of time because uh, it is my conviction, if you want to present a text like the Da Fang Xi Ji, probably a lot of other texts follow certainly also can talk to that um you you need con deep contextualization you need to actually give uh yourself to understand the text properly and also to the reader to the audience whatever it is uh, as much information as uh, can be given uh, in order to uh kind of, as i said not only the text that's one thing but also the the text passages because of course this is a travelogue so it goes from one place to another it goes from one let's say narrative that is linked and we will hear a lot about narratives uh, in uh, in the in the talk um it's about narratives linked to let's say uh, the life of the buddha in most cases so this is the place where the following happens so in order to understand what's going on in the text what's going on maybe in Xuanzang's mind when he writes it uh it is important actually to uh, to fully contextualize it so that takes a lot of time uh, just to give you an idea of where I am, uh, I've, um, I've translated and commented the uh, first three fascicles completely. So they are kind of ready to go, still need some work, but then they are ready to go. They have been edited by uh, native speakers because I'm German. So, um, And uh, yeah, and then I had to jump because of the aforementioned project when I was asked to uh, be part of that Xuanzang uh, trail uh, in Bihar, in the uh, Indian state of Bihar, where, as you probably know, a lot of these important Buddhist sites are, and we will uh, deal with one of them today, uh, the place of enlightenment, Bodh Gaya. Um, I was asked to actually be part of that, or be kind of a crucial part, because that's in the title. So I'm, I'm, I'm the one controlling the text, and there are the um, field archaeologists in Bihar who know the landscape like nobody else, and that's, I think, a very good match. We've done so far four exploration tours, covered most of Bihar, and now are in the complement, uh, complementation. Uh, well, we are now trying to apply what we actually found out. Uh, we are working with the Bihar Museum, uh, so that all has something to do a little bit with what I'm doing uh, today in the talk. Now, when Dorothy asked me uh, to suggest some topics for my lecture, I originally gave her four possible topics, all related, of course, to this text uh, or to this guy, to the Da Tang Xi Ji. Uh, one was uh, visiting the navel of the earth, the historical context of Chinese inscriptions from Bodh Gaya, which would have been my favorite because then I wouldn't have to do two talks, one for Arizona, exactly on that, and another one for Virginia, but I'm happy to have done it like that. Um, then uh, the one that uh, we have now, and uh, the other two were about uh, identifying archaeological sites um, uh, uh, with the help of Xuanzang, and then also uh, another one talking about the biography of Xuanzang, because there is, of course, some problem with the reception of not only the text, but also uh, its author by mixing up, for instance, the biographical material that is quite big in this case with the autograph, which is this travelogue. 
So people tend to uh, kind of read the, either the travel log and then say, okay, now let's have a look what is going on uh, in the Datang GT. Or more often, they look at the Datang GT, Datang GT and then they look at the travel log and then they look at the uh, biography and say, uh, be because he's not really acting in the, in the travel log, he's just describing. Um, let, let's see what he really did. And that's of course not working. That that's that's a tricky a tricky way to to uh, to deal very positivistically with text. Anyway, so I gave these four topics, and to be honest, I would have been surprised uh, if Dorothy had not picked the one which <laughs> I will torment you now in the next forty five minutes or so. Um, and I am still quite happy to be the torture, as the topic uh, dovetails quite nicely with my own work and interest in these Chinese travel logs more generally, also the other ones uh, that exist. And of course, also the story. So I'm mainly dealing with stories with narratives, and then I'm, I'm trying to contextualize them also with, a core, of course, material culture, meaning art, history, um, uh, archaeology, etc. And that's where my expertise is not. So uh, th therefore, I'm quite nice. Uh, I'm quite happy to be exposed, because then I may get something back. Um, now, according to the Buddhist narrative tradition, also, this is, and I'm not sure if this is already, oh, this, is, this is our guy. Um, uh, also, this is, of course, and as we will see, not a uniform and consistent tradition, but one that has developed over time and sometimes in quite a diverse, a diverse way. So we get a lot of different uh, narratives of the same episode in the life of the Buddha. Now, the Buddha image, understood as a painted or sculpted one, is older than relics, uh, if we believe the Buddhist tradition. The latter taken in the narrow sense uh, uh, as being a bodily or material remain of the Buddha, the relic. But then again, uh, there are also, and that shows how diverse the tradition actually is, uh, there are also the stories of the god taking the hair knot of the Bodhisattva uh, as a relic up to heaven, which he cuts off when getting rid of his princely attire after the great departure from the palace. Um, while one could argue that uh, these relics were relics which were out of reach of the veneration through humans in the story, uh, there is also the story of the donation of two portions of hair relics through the Buddha to the two merchants Balika and Trapusha, I'm, I, I'm using the Sanskrit terminology here, who, who give uh, the first alms to the Buddha right after his enlightenment. So as a kind of recompensation, uh, they uh, get this, these relics and they take them back to the northwest uh, of the subcontinent, probably to a region that is nowadays Patria in Afghanistan, to enshrine them in what then, according to the narrative tradition, would be the first Buddhist relic stupa. Uh, in terms of quality, this kind of relics, nails and hair, however, is of a quite different quality than uh, the what we normally uh, probably would associate, associate with relics, Buddha relics, that is edge and bone relics, maybe a tooth or something else. Um, since these, so nails and hair, are, first of all, pre mortem. Uh, they are, are what one could call, what I would call, self-recreative. Because, of course, nails and hair... They grow all the time, so we had to do shaving and clipping all the time. That's why actually Xuanzang tells us about a lot of nail and hair relic stupas uh, all over India. These were the, the most <laughs> frequent and probably reproductive uh, relics that you actually could find. Now, according to the Buddhist narrative tradition, the first image of the Buddha was created for King Udayana during his lifetime, during the Buddha's lifetime. Uh, this is the famous image, of course, uh, the history and the history, uh, art history of which uh, is been studied by Dorothy at depth, uh, which prompted me not to use that example uh, in the talk today. Um, I just would like to point out that the underlying motivation of this story and a lot of others seems to be a kind of horror absentia, the trauma of the Buddha's absence and non-accessibility after Parinirvana, but which is also present in other stories about what I will deal with, so-called true images of the Buddha. Uh, and I will talk about two. Uh, so the image of Udayana, for instance, was produced to compensate for the three months absence of the Buddha when he had ascended to Trayastrimsha heaven to teach the Dharma to his deceased mother Mahamaya. So he wasn't down on earth, they couldn't uh, venerate him, so create something that could be venerated. I think that the difference between the Udayana image 
And the ones I have selected, these two, is that the form of the Udayana, although it was human-made, received its miraculous power and authority through the encounter with and acknowledgement through the Buddha when he came back from heaven and said, yeah, yeah, you, you, you are my kind of, you're my guy. Um, and the authority which it, uh, it got from it. While my two images, uh, I will come to uh, them in a moment, um, the so-called shadow of the Buddha in the cave, in a cave near Nagarahara in Gandhara, uh, Kabul, near Kabul in Afghanistan nowadays, and the Buddha image in the Mahabodhi temple at the place of enlightenment, achieved their powerful status, their supernatural origin or creation. My discussion will be not so much about uh, the alleged uh, miraculous potency of these images and their legacy in Buddhist Asia. That's what Dorothy does at depth. Uh, although I recognize that these are, of course, important points, but about the imaginary which empowered these images in the first place by the narratives ascribed and attached to them. I'm well aware that talking about images as, as a textual scholar bears some risk of not knowing enough about Buddhist art history and thus making stupid statements, but I'm more than happy to take the risk in the hope of getting some kind of comments that will help me to contextualize better. Now, although Buddhist traditions, so I was talk a little bit about uh, relics and images in more general terms as I see them. Uh, although Buddhist tradition uh, has it that the first image was produced when the Buddha was still alive, historically it is more likely, almost certain, that the relics played an earlier and more important role in the development of the religion than images, which starts to emerge in the Kushana period, that is probably from the second century of the Common Era, uh, almost simultane simultaneously in Gandhara in the northwest of India and in Mathura, more to the east, uh, after a period of an iconic, and I think I have something here, yeah, uh, after a period of an iconic representation of the Buddha in earlier Buddhist art. So I have chosen here very randomly, so that already shows that I'm not an art historian, I'm just going for what I like. Um, or what fits, I think, to my uh, topic. So you get here um, a Gandharan piece from, why is there, why is this? I mean, it seems to be that this matches the, um, um, the bars I have to control the, is that better? Yeah, well, uh, no, no. this one is gone now, yes, but the other one's still there. This is this one. Let me drag it down. Yeah, it's gone. Yeah. Okay. So, in case we get another kind of, I'm, 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 I'm really bad with PowerPoint. So I fill them up to the very end of the slides. So sometimes it may con still conflict. So this one, of course, on the left hand side, you have what I called an, uh, an iconic. Uh, that's from Barhut, uh, the Barhut Stupa, the famous one, first century BC. You can see the Bodhi tree uh, with a Bodhi with a with a with a uh, diamond throne where the Buddha is supposed to sit mm -hmm. underneath the tree and reach enlightenment. But I've chosen that one because it shows the Naga scene. Uh, probably with uh, the, the, the Naga, the, the, the serpentine creatures here coming out of the water. And uh, uh, my guess is, I'm not quite sure, art historians may slap me for that, uh, that uh, this Naga in the center with the five heads is probably an, an, an iconic uh, um, representation of the famous Muchalinda uh, uh, snake that covers the Buddha after enlightenment against a, a, a thunderstorm. And you have the same thing then on the right hand side, the same motif from Gandhara, an early Gandhara piece from the second century, provenance not known, where you have the Buddha actually encoiled by the snake. So the hood is missing, but you have uh, you have this really nice uh, uh, depiction of uh, the encoilment of the Buddha to protect him, which of course is then only half an iconic one because half of the body is missing. You could make that point. Um, now, Emphasis on relics is, in a way, and I'm going back to my uh, text, uh, confirmed by a very famous uh, passage in the final part of the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, of the sutra which covers the last, let's say, three months or so of the Buddha's life and also his death and the distribution of relic, uh, no, which puts the instruction to and how to enshrine his bodily relics into stupas uh, is put directly into the Buddha's mouth. It's one of his last messages to his uh, uh, followers. 
And I quote, you should not be sad. This, by the way, is not taken from the Sanskrit text. In this case, I went to the Chinese uh, Chang Ahanjing, the Dilagagama, uh, in order to have a Chinese one. Uh, you should not be sad. Sons from good families always have four things to ponder about. Which are the four? One is called the memory of the place where the Buddha was born. They rejoice and want to see it, remember it, not forget it, and it creates affection. The second is called the memory of the place where the Buddha first achieved awakening. And you see that comes the normal repetitive style of Buddhist texts. So I'm doing exactly what a lot of Buddhist copyists would do. Pialam, seen as seen as above. So I will skip this part. The third is called the memory of the place where the Buddha turned the wheel of the Dharma. So that's the um, first sermon, of course. The fourth is called the memory of the place where Buddha entered Parinirvana. They rejoice and want to see it, remember it, not forget it, and it creates affection. Ananda, so he's addressing his uh, servant Ananda. After my Parinirvana, when sons and daughters from good families remember the birth of the Buddha, the merit will be accordingly. When they remember the awakening of the Buddha, the spiritual power will be accordingly. When they remember the turning of the wheel of the Dharma, the conversion of people will be accordingly. Everybody who visits these places, travels there, and venerates the stupas and shrines will, after death, be born in heaven, but will not reach enlightenment. This is a very strange kind of subphrase in the Chinese translation, which is missing in the Pali and the Sanskrit. Uh, the same text then also, as we note, describes the distribution of the relics after the cremation of the Buddha's body to different kings. And to the king, to the Brahmana Drona, who oversees the sharing of the relics between the different policies, the kings, in order to avoid violence and war about the relics, which of course would be very counterproductive against the Buddha's Dharma. Uh, now, let me expand a little bit about um, the categories and some of the functions of uh, uh, relics in a traditional Buddhist understanding. Uh, as is well known, Buddhist tradition. Uh, divides uh, relics uh, into three categories, and I've taken most of this from John Strong's uh, book on, on relics because it was very easy, uh, easily uh, accessible. Uh, so first of all, the, the relics as such, the so-called uh, bodily relics, the sharirika in Sanskrit, are the, uh, the shares of ash or bones collected after the Parinirvana, according to the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, but also at the later stage of development, um, you could call it historically the invention of, of relics. So uh, the relic cult that actually tries to increase the number of relics that were not mentioned in the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, like the teeth, the collarbone, the crane bone, the eyeballs, the hair and the nails, etc., etc. About the hair and the nails I've already uh, talked. Um, then we have the so-called contact relics, the paribhogika, so the, yeah, the, 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 the objects that the Buddha was in contact uh, with uh, or he possessed, so that, that were the ropes, and there are many ropes, obviously, arm bowl, arms bowl, mendicant staff, and other stuff. Uh, stuff which uh, he uh, came into contact in a meaningful way. So the Bodhi tree or the, the, the seat of enlightenment, and that, of course, will be a, partly a topic of uh, the Bodhgaya uh, uh, part of this talk. And then there are the kind of, you could say, most distant uh, relics uh, to the Buddha directly, the indicati uh, indicative relics, the Udeshika. So these are the stupas and chaityas, not necessarily then uh, containing uh, um, relics, but just representing the presence of the Buddha. Images, that's the ones we will be talking about, called Bimba or uh, Pratima in Sanskrit, footprints, Udapadas which he leaves at some places when he does some exciting uh, uh, act, uh, all symbolizing, of course, the, uh, the absence, presence of the Buddha. Now, one may argue that the quest for real images of the Buddha, now similar to the much younger quest, for instance, of the real image of Christ on the Shroud of Turin, uh, is a natural consequence of the amalgamation of the Buddhist relic cult, and uh, which is older historically, and the already mentioned trauma of the Buddha's absent post parinirvana, and the paradox of his presence in and through relics uh, in stupas and chaityas. At that stage of development, one can imagine an image which could claim to be a true representation of the Buddha, made during his lifetime or in a very miraculous way. Um, in a way, an authentic and authoritative placeholder of the Buddha 
would then be another category of relics in the sense of the Latin word uh, relinquere, to leave behind, but also in the sense of the Indic word for relic, sharira, which means body. So it's the full body of the Buddha. Yeah? They were even more complete than the primary relics, which were only small portions of um, the bodily remains of the Buddha after his cremation, while of course the image is complete. It shows all the marks that a Buddha is supposed to have, and we will see how that plays a role. The more the image, uh, uh, the image of the Buddha could claim authenticity and thereby authority, but being original in the sense of being linked to an event in the life of the Buddha, or an effigy in the sense of being a true image of the Buddha, the more it reached the status of a relic with the re respective forms of pilgrimage, veneration, and miraculous uh, faculties like the emission of light, Dorothy has worked about that, healing power, ability to move, and other, uh, other miraculous things. There is a certain asymmetry, I would claim, at work uh, in so far um, uh, the, that uh, the need for such complete and true representations of the Buddha are later, although they are complete, they are, uh, historically speaking, they are later than the various uh, relics distributed across the Indian subcontinent. Remember the famous story of King Ashoka, who takes the original six, six relics out of their stupas and distributes them in, uh, uh, how many are there, 84,000 stupas all over Jambudvipa, which then can be interpreted as being India. But of course, Jambudvipa is a quite general term, uh, and, and you can interpret it very gen generously and say, yeah, all across the world that is inhabited by human beings. So the Chinese could claim their shares uh, as well, and they did. Now, John Strong, in his aforementioned book on Buddhist relics, elaborating on the discussion of other scholars like Bob Scharf and Kevin Trainer, stresses the necessity to discern images from relics. I just said that these true images are like relics. Well, it goes against the normal scholarly opinion, and I quote uh, John, uh, there has been a tendency in Western studies to lump together relics with images, as well as with stupas and other things that denote or signify the Buddha, or are thought to embody his Buddhahood. There are certain problems with this inclusion and images uh, in the category of relics, unquote. Now, at best, uh, John Strong seems to accept that images are Uddeshika Sharira, so indicating indicative uh, relics, but not that they are primary relics. And I would say in most cases, yes, in some cases, no. He also makes the point that the Buddha image is less efficacious than a relic, partly proven by the fact that sometimes relics are enshrined in a Buddha statue, usually in an opening in the head or in the back of the, uh, of the head, uh, where you have little I mean, chambers, if you like, uh, where obviously they uh, put in some portions of relics, in order to empower the image, bring it to life. However, I would claim that there is a difference between a normal image of the Buddha and the ones that claim to be true projections of the Buddha when he was still alive or uh, who were, which were created by a superhuman agent. So we have both cases in the examples I've chosen. I've, cho I've chosen one uh, where the Buddha left something behind, an image, uh, at his lifetime. So actively, if you like, and another one which was created under very miraculous circumstances and uh, claimed to be a, a, a true representation of the Buddha. So these, I would claim, are like relics. It does not necessarily conflict with the claim that images are not relics as such. Now, the special features of the Buddha, so we got some proof of that in a Buddhist text, and I think I have them here. Uh, the special features of the Buddha's form, Sanskrit rupa, in all its kind of um, different uh, meanings, shadow, shades of meanings. Although it is clear that the text speaks about the body of the Buddha, the term can be, and is also taken as referring to an authentic representation of the Buddha, are clearly elaborated uh, on in uh, a Buddhist uh, poet's um, uh, 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 text, the uh, Shatapancha Satka of Matri, uh, Matri Cheta. Uh, that's an uh, eulogical poem praising the Buddha as such. It's probably from the second century AD, so it's very close to people like Ashwagosha, who wrote a biography of the Buddha. So, uh, obviously, there was something going on at the time where they were very interested in, uh, uh, in the Buddha and his, uh, and his form. Uh, this form of yours, calm yet lovely, brilliant yet not dazzling, modest yet mighty, whom would it not entrance? 
That form of yours pleases the eye of him who has seen it a hundred times and of him who views it for the first time, both alike, because it never sa uh, satiates the beholder and because of its mild aspect, your body gives fresh delight as often as it is seen. Your figure has the qualities proper to a, a receptacle, your virtues those proper to an occupant. By reason whereof, both are endowed with the highest excellence, and the excellence of each is adapted to the uh, to that of the other, and so on and so forth. So you get you get the gist, right? I mean, it's, it's a praise of the of the shape, which you can actually uh, uh, claim it is about the Buddha when he was alive, but of course also about certain images, certain the true image of the Buddha, for instance. Another text. The Maitreya Simanada Sutra, a Mahayana text of a Ratnakuta collection of sutras, the Bauji, uh, that may be dated roughly to the Kushan period, 2nd century, 4th century AD. That's important because all of that, as I said, seems to happen in that period, 2nd, 3rd century uh, AD, and maybe uh, also regionally more in the north, uh, northwest uh, of the Indian continent than, than anywhere else. Uh, so this text is extant uh, only in a Chinese translation. We don't have the original uh, Indian text. Uh, it's a Chinese translation from the Sui dynasty, late 6th century. And we have a Tibetan translation of the 9th century, which at least shows that the text had an authentic Sanskrit or Indian Indic original. If it's only a, a Chinese translation, there are always voices immediately saying, eh, maybe it's an apocryph. But in this case, if you have a, a, a Tibetan translation and it's not... A translation of the Chinese, then you got an Indian uh, text underlying. So this text um, talks about uh, the real image of the Buddha in a kind of indirect way, uh, denying that uh, um, that you actually can make Buddha images and uh, take profit out of them. So it, it has been read as an iconoclastic text. It is probably not. So let's have a look at the text. The Buddha said, O Kashyapa, so he talks to his uh, eminent disciple Maha Kashyapa, what do you think? Can a god or a naga or a yaksha, a demon or kind of ghost, or a Gandharva or an Asura or a Garuda or a Kimnara or Mahuraga or a human or non-human produce the image of the bodily form of the Tathagata? Kashyapa said to the Buddha, no, a world honored. One, the image of the form of the Tathagata is inconceivable because it is a formless. Arupa would probably be the Sanskrit image. Therefore, all these cannot produce it. The Buddha told Kashyapa, in a future age, in the, later, in the latter 500 years of the Dharma, there are pictures who have not practiced with their body, have not practiced with their mind, have not practiced, with the, um, practiced, the, practiced the precepts, the Shila, have not practiced wisdom, Prajna, if these produce an image of the Tathagata on a cloth or on a wall for gaining their living, then they are self-assuming uh, arrogant people. So it's one of these prophecies that the, that the Buddha does all the time. Thereupon Mahakashyapa said to, to the Buddha, a world-honored one, when King Prasenajit made an image of the Tathagata, that is related to the Dayana picture uh, 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 Dorothy is working on, did he not achieve merit? The Buddha said, O Kashyapa, he did achieve a lot of merit. When King Prasenajit made the image of the Tathagata, he donated it without buying clothes, did not ask for recompensation in form of clothes and food. O Kashyapa, these foolish people, now he talks about the monks again, however, made images to earn their living. So two important things here. The Buddha, first of all, says, uh, well, a real Buddha, Buddha image cannot be made by all these category of beings. So it's not it's not doable. Uh, then at the same time, he does not deny that making images actually can create merit. If it's done in a in a good intention and intentionality. During the time left, as I said, uh, I would like to discuss two different examples of true images of the Buddha, which reflect two different modes, I would claim, of establishing this kind of image in a religious uh, social context. The first example is, as I said, the so-called shadow of the Buddha in the subcontinent's northwest, the ancient uh, geography uh, region of Gandhara. And the second one is the famous Buddha image inside of the Mahabodhi temple of the Shrine of Enlightenment at Bodh Gaya. So case studies, as you would expect, start with the stories that Xuanzang gives us and uh, will then hopefully move into a kind of contextualization of these images. So we start with... Oops, 
what happened here. So what you should have here, but never mind, you should have a map of India. I can't actually point one of the maps because this is the French uh, section here, so they don't have India. Um, anyway, so that would be a map of Xuanzang where I wanted to point out where we are at, uh, in the subcontinent. I think I have another map which will show it uh, to you. Uh, so both places are quite a distance from each other. So we start with the shadow of the Buddha in Nagarahara and uh, disclaimer, this is not the shadow in uh, the cave in Nagarahara. This I've taken randomly from the internet. It was too nice to resist. It's in one of these uh, caves in Thailand. I don't remember exactly which ones where you have thousands of Buddha statues and where the light has some kind of strange, creates some strange uh, shadows. And so you got one of the Buddha uh, Buddha's projected against the wall. That's probably a kind of get an impression how that shadow in the cave actually uh, in the historical period I'm talking about would have looked like. Ah, here we go. At least the map, not the whole of India, but just to um, kind of show you where we are. We are, it has the pointer. Yes, it has. But it doesn't, doesn't reflect on. Uh, so. Maybe, no, I can't actually point out. So we are talking about this area now. So this is the, uh, oh, it's not inside. I thought I did something there. <laughs> <laughs> Miraculous. So um, you see, um, this is this, this is the Palmy Karakorum range, right? Um, uh, the famous, the fam just to give you some orientation, the famous uh, uh, destroyed two uh, giant Buddhas of Bamiyan would be somewhere up here. So Xuanzang came across the mountains, entered northwestern India, so the, the plain of Peshawar, um, today's Pakistan, to the Kabul Valley, and hit this place where you have a cluster of kind of relevant places that are linked, as we will see, to a visit of the Buddha in the northwestern region. Not kind of central Kandahar, but uh, kind of um, a border region. Now, uh, this is the Dark uh about the shadow. Uh, I give you the full text because it contains narrative elements that are quite relative. To the southwest of the monastery, and here is talking about the monastery where uh, Buddha relics uh, were to be found, near the city of uh, Nagarahara, uh, there is a deep and pre uh, pre uh, precipitous uh, ravine uh, with cataracts gushing down and hanging precipices standing up like a wall. The cliff on the eastern shore, there is a big cavern in which the Naga, the serpentine being Gopala, lived. I'm not going into the form of the names in the Chinese, but that's a pretty safe reconstruction. The access is narrow and small, and the cavern is obscure and dim. Water drops from the stones of the cliff, oops, stones of the cliff uh, and the creek uh, has stopped flowing. Former times, there was the shadow of the Buddha, which shone like his real appearance. The major and the minor marks were complete and solemn as if he himself was present. In recent times, people did not see the complete shadow, and even what is seen does only look like it or like him. Only those sincerely wishing and dedicating, uh, dedicated to see it or him may clearly see it for a short time, but even they cannot perceive it very long. Once now comes the story. Uh, when the Tathagata was in the world, this Naga was a herdsman and provided the king with curds. But when the king gave him an, uh, an inappropriate gift, heck, he became condemned uh, to be full of hatred. So the Naga. He spent money to buy flowers, donated them to the stupa of the Buddha's prophecy. He vowed to be reborn as an evil Naga to harm the king and immediately rushed on top of a cliff, threw down his body and died. By consequence, in his next life, he dwelt in this cave as a Naga king. Following his desire, he came out of this hole to fulfill his evil vow and to satisfy his own mind. Because of the damage which the Naga inflicted, which is normally sending too much rain or holding back the rain, because Nagas are in control of, of water, um, uh, because, uh, because uh, of the damage which the Naga inflicted, the Tathagata in, in, in central India felt compassion with the people of this kingdom and through his magic power he went there from central India, flew through the air of course. When the Naga saw the Tathagata, his evil mind became appeased, he took the precept of not taking life and wished to 
protect the true dharma. Therefore, he asked the Tathagata, may you always stay in this cave and may all your holy disciples receive my donations forever. The Tathagata said to him, I will soon enter Nirvana, but I will leave you my shadow and five arhats who always will receive your donations. Even when the true dharma vanishes, this matter will be not in vain. In your evil mind, uh, if your evil mind is filled with rage again, you should look at my shadow left behind and through, uh, through my benevolence, your evil mind will be appeased. Out of compassion, the future Buddhas in this Padrakalpa uh, will also leave the shape of their shadows with you. Outside of the entrance of the shadow cave are two rectangular stones. One of, uh, on one of these stones are the footsteps of the Tathagata, which mark, um, with, with marks of the wheel of the Dharma, faintly visible, but sometimes shining brilliantly. The stone chambers to the right and left of the shadow cave are the places in which the holy disciples of the Tathagata meditated or entered Samadhi. At the northwestern corner of the shadow cave is a stupa, which marks the place where the Buddha walked in meditation. In the stupa beside are the hairs and nails of the Tathagata. Well, that's what you would expect. Close to it, not far away, there is a stupa, which marks the place where the Tathagata had revealed the true meaning of the Dharma, and so on and so forth. I uh, skipped the uh, last sentence. So um, you got the story. Oh, yes, sorry. Um, next time, push me gently. In the Okay, so uh, this is a kind of typical setup in the Datang Shi Ji. Uh, a place is described, uh, its relevance is described, its meaning, and then uh, the story is given. Um, now, uh, with this one, uh, this, this is a very uh, particular one because we can trace it uh, back to the other Chinese visitors. So we can actually say, uh, uh, we can state a certain terminus at quem, where obviously the place had transformed into a grim place, no, not only with the shadow, which was the main feature, but also with other relics, with the footprint of the Buddha, with other uh, relics that he left behind. Um, so the earliest account of the legend is the one by the earliest Chinese travelogue by Fasian in the beginning of the 5th century, who had been in Nagarahara around 402. Um, so we come back to that one in a moment. Uh, I'm a little bit reluctant now to read this completely out, but you can see that this for, for the period of the beginning of the fifth century also kind of talks about uh, the uh, the relics that were around and also talks about the shadow. Now, what is missing here is the story of the Naga that is not given. But we can imply from some of the features in the text that the Naga story was existent already. There is this, uh, let's see where it is. Uh, oh, yes, uh, at the very beginning on that page. When the soil of the kingdom is dried out, people gather and bring out the garment of the Buddha, so the relic, uh, venerate it and give donations. Immediately there will be heavy rain. So this obviously refers to this uh, story of the Naga, and uh, I can't go into detail. There's a parallel story in the same region. I'll come to that in a, uh, in a moment, uh, where uh, the Naga actually is doing damage to the region by, as I said before, withholding rain or sending too much rain. And the Buddha interferes, and he subdues the Naga and forces it to act benevol uh, benevolently. Right? Uh, in the case of this, as I said, there is no Naga, but we can imply that the Naga story at that time was already there. Uh, we have another evidence of the same story, and now in this case, it's already complete from the beginning of the 6th century. It's in the famous uh, Luoyang, uh, I say Jialangji, Jialangji, uh, the record of the, the monasteries in the uh, capital of, of Luoyang. Where you have, as you probably know, uh, a section that talks about a visit of an embassy, a Chinese embassy, to the northwest, to Gandhara. Uh, Tsung Yun uh, is the name that is normally affiliated with it. But in that text, they are uh, sprinkled in some bits and pieces from another travelogue, uh, not necessarily, uh, um, uh, well, not known actually by a guy called Tao Yao. And this is uh, taken from that. Uh, and you can see that there is actually the same story. So it's about the uh, the, the shadow cave. It gives you even the name of the Naga, 
Uh, where is it? Ah, uh, oops, sorry. No, that's the... where is the uh, down there. The Naga Gopala. Again, I'm not going into uh, the philological detail details in identifying the Chinese form of the name, but it's clear that it's the uh, Naga Gopala. Which, by the way, in Xuanzang's story is etiologically explained. If you remember, I read that fully out. It says that it was a herdsman that actually then transformed into a naga. A herdsman in Sanskrit would actually be called Gopala, protector of the, of, 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 of the cattle. Yeah. So there's an etiological explanation for that. So here we got the, um, uh, the full fledged story already at the beginning of the sixth century. There are other evidences for the importance of the shadow. Uh, and here I'm just leaving my manuscript because I think it's easier to do it with what I have on, on screen. Uh, so we got a constant series of witnesses of the importance of this site. It starts with another pilgrim whose uh, travelogue is not preserved. There are only small short snippets. Yutie are uh, something like Dharmakara. Uh, around 420, so that's a little bit later than Xuanzang, uh, says he visited the cave of uh, the Shadow and of the Naga. Uh, another uh, traveler, Bao Yun, um, uh, a little bit uh, later, another one in the mid uh, 9th century, Dao Pu. Uh, and then we have the famous reference to the Shadow Cave by uh, uh, Shi Dao An's uh, disciple Hui Yan. Uh, who was a very important figure um, uh, at the beginning of the 5th century for the development of Chinese Buddhism, who was so fond of the story that he actually tried to uh, reenact the whole scene uh, at uh, Lushan, at the mountain. He, was, he had his, his monastery, so he created a cave and inside actually uh, set up an image of the Buddha in order to go and meditate and visualize uh, visu visualize the true form of the Buddha. And that was linked to uh, the um, to the Indian monk, Buddha Padra, who worked with Huyen and was interestingly a native according to the biographies from Nagarahara. So he obviously had uh, local regional knowledge. And not only that, uh, Buddha Padra uh, translated a text that is preserved, the text uh, in the last line, the Guan Po San Nei Hai Jing, so the Buddha Anusmriti Samadhi Sagara Sutra, that's a reconstruction, of course, because the original uh, Indian text is not uh, there, which gives you exactly the, almost exactly the same story of the Naga Gopala without the name, without the name Gopala, of the shadow of the Buddha, of all the relics that are mentioned, as Xuanzang gives it. All this is, of course, not only evidence of the extreme popularity of that site, of the shadow of the Buddha, but also shows that, uh, well, a kind of timeline. We can, we, can, we can probably say that beginning of the 5th century, the full-fledged story was already in place. And the story was, and if we actually push it a little bit further, we can link it to another story uh, from the region, uh, the conversion of another uh, serpentine being, the Naga Apalala, which in this case can be dated earlier than the uh, Shadow Cave because we have uh, depictions of the scene in uh, Gandhara uh, art, which ranges from the 2nd century to the 4th century or beginning of the 5th century. This is a relative early one, which clearly de depicts the Buddha uh, to Naga figures. You can always identify them with the hoods. Uh, on top of the head, so probably, very probably, uh, a, a Naga king because he has this special uh, head dress. Uh, and then the other one, uh, it could be a, a female uh, Naga that would actually fit to the known story of that conversion. That story is um, is preserved not only in Gandharan art but also in a Sanskrit text. It is preserved uh, in the um, uh, in the story of the visit of the Buddha to the northwest. Um, which does not contain our shadow uh, story, but contains this conversion. And that's found in the uh, Sanskrit version of the Mula Savastivada Vinaya. It's a Sanskrit text, we have a Tibetan, we have a Chinese translation of that. It's well confirmed. So this one seems to be quite old. This seems to be older than the Gopala uh, legend. And uh, if you analyze the elements in that story and in the Gopala legend, uh, you can actually see that the Gopala legend is an adaptation of the earlier, the Apalala uh, conversion or subjugation story, 
plus some further elements. The shadow, for instance, the shadow of the Buddha makes it obviously much more powerful than this one. This one happens in Svat, which is, if I go back to the, to the map, hopefully at some point, so this, the, this map. So uh, again, the shadow is here, right, in the Kabul Valley, quite accessible because that was one of the transit points uh, into India uh, from, from Central Asia. The Naga Apalala would be, I just had it somewhere, up the Swat Valley some, somewhere here. So very inaccessible. Uh, so well, what happened quite likely was, okay, we have a story. We want to create a pilgrimage place. We have that story of the visit of the Buddha in the Northwest. Let's create a better located one and let's pop it up a little bit. Uh, let's make it more attractive. And the shadow uh, image story actually came into place. Okay, this is the one with the shadow. Um, I think I'm already up too much. Yeah, what I wanted to show you actually is also that we have archaeological evidence of the existence of this in a place near where probably the cave was. The cave never really has been identified uh, um, uh, 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 unique, but we have a monastic site very close to where probably the cave was a com monastic complex called Hadda, which was excavated when excavations in Afghanistan were still possible. And uh, what they found in this um, in this complex are so-called niches. So you get around, you go around the stupa and you get niches where certain things were obviously stories were depicted. And one of them had this. It's uh, the so-called fish port, because there are some fish at, actually, and they can see them on, on, on the wall. It's mostly stucco, so uh, a lot of that stuff has been destroyed. But you can already see here on this one, there are um, there are not there are serpents, there are there are creatures like that, right? There's also a kneeling figure here. There was a statue here on that side, which is gone. But w what is more in important is a complete view of the cave. Still has the remnants of a figure that is kneeling in front of where a Buddha image was at the back. Yeah, you can see that the contours are still there. The holes for, for fixing the image is still there. The image is gone. The whole cave now probably is, is completely gone because of the, the trouble that, that we have in, in, in that area. Um, so although there is no head, it's very likely and has been identified that uh, this kneeling figure is the Naga king who is in subjugation posture in front of the Buddha. So this cave actually very close, uh, uh, this cave scene very close to the cave that really had the shadow obviously uh, depicts the narrative um, in that region. There's other smaller evidence that this this conversion story obviously made into a lot of uh, smaller um, uh, embellishments around the, uh, uh, the site, for instance, the detail of the stupa decoration, uh, where you have again, the Naga king, and probably the one had a hood as well. It's broken, but um, a female figure, because there are female uh, um, uh, figures in the story as well. So that would confirm that. There's a lotus, and the excavator, uh, an Afghani uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, archaeologist working uh, in, 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 in France, actually claims that there was a Buddha statue sitting on top of the lotus. That also would confirm then, of course, uh, the existence and the popularity of the story. Uh, this is dated to the 4th, 5th century AD. So it would be a fit also from the archaeological side. Now we move to the, to the second one. It's high time. Um, how many time do I have? How much time? OK. So uh, this can be a little bit uh, faster. So we're talking about uh, the Buddha image, the true Buddha image inside of the Mahabodhi temple. This is what you see nowadays. So it, it is under veneration. Uh, it's sometimes very hard to get in because there's so many pilgrims wanting to want to go in and it's police is controlling how many get in. Um, monks are doing the veneration. It's been gilded recently. Um, I'll show you a couple of pictures. Um, it has been excavated by Alexander Cunningham, the infamous uh, uh, first director of the Archaeological Survey, uh, Survey of India, infamous because he did not only excavation, but also a lot of damage by his excavation methods and other stuff. Um, 
this is how the Mahabodhi temple on the left hand side looked before restoration on a on a on a photograph and uh, on a picture so that you can get an imagination what it actually looked like. Um, the entrance is through here. So this is gone now. When, when during the renovations, they actually cut that down. It was a three-story kind of entrance passage. This is after restoration. Uh, you can see that it's depicted uh, on a lot of um, objects from India. It was one of the central uh, places of veneration, of course. This is the Buddha statue inside of the Mahabodhi temple, which is, however, and definitely not the image the texts are talking about because it is a Pala image dated to the 10th, 11th century. It's nice, it's beautiful, but it's not the original picture the texts are talking about. Uh, but you see it in the typical uh, earth-touching gesture. All these images, as we will see from Bodh Gaya, uh, claiming to be the original one or being later ones, actually show the earth-touching gesture, which is quite important in order to actually uh, try and attempt a dating. Uh, again, uh, on other objects, on a terracotta block, uh, again, you can see the Buddha figure, and that may be a little closer to the original one, um, with an earth-touching gesture inside of a stylized Mahabodhi temple. Um, and now we probably should go back to the text, very briefly at least. Um, so the Tavrangiji Xuanzang's text contains the description of the production of the creation of the original image. It says, now I'm paraphrasing and not reading it out, uh, that after the uh, Mahabodhi temple, or not in the shape as we have it now, uh, was completed, uh, it was uh, constructed by a, a Brahmin. Um, uh, the Brahmin wanted to have a, a, an image inside, and it should be an image as closely to the, uh, to the real Buddha as, as, as possible. So they had problems finding a, a craftsman who could do it, and suddenly a person shows up and says, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a skilled artisan, I can do a, an image of the Buddha exactly as uh, he was at his lifetime, with all the 32 main marks and the uh, 82 minor marks. That was very important, because of course it sh showed that you had the real image of the Buddha. Uh, you just have to uh, kind of, uh, in front, just I get inside, you give me scented mud, and you give me uh, enough oil for the lamp, and then you close the temple, after six months you open it again. So they got a little bit uh, anxious after almost six months is over, nothing has happened, nothing could be here. Okay, let's open. They open the cave, the image is there, almost complete with some kind of uh, defect here, uh, uh, which then miraculously is, is healed in a way. Um, no artisan. But they hear a voice in the air saying, I am Maitreya, I have created this image. That already knows that story quite well. And has also actually pointed out that uh, the link between Maitreya and uh, art production actually is uh, attested in other cases, where either someone goes up, an artisan goes up to the heaven to uh, Maitreya, where Maitreya is waiting for his advent uh, on earth, and actually makes an image of the Bodhisattva when he's in heaven a true image again, or where in this case Maitreya is actually involved. Um, now, one thing I wanted to point out here is the, uh, the, the detail which is repeated in several reports. So the famous uh, uh, ambassador Wang Shenzi, who uh, a Tung ambassador who uh, came to India at least three times, around the same time as Xuanzang the first time, and then later again, has pretty much the same story. He gives, so he actually confirms what Chen Zhang has to say. And more interestingly, uh, the Tibetan visitor Dharma Swami in, in the um, um, I think it's, uh, early 12th century has a similar story. It's not exactly the same story, but it is about the miraculous production of the image inside of the Mahabodhi temple. So he, of course, would have seen the image I showed you, so the, the later one. But never mind. I mean, for a, for a viewer, of course, it doesn't. If he believes it, it is the the uh, the original picture. Now, interesting here is that uh, he, he creates it from scented mud, which um, suggests that the image, the original image, was not a stone image. It was probably a terracotta, well, not probably a stucco image or something that was covered uh, with stucco. That, of course, has has gone. It's not it's not there anymore. But there are some uh, details which help to actually 
um, make a kind of chronology. So if you look at the last part of this text, let's say the last half, where Xuanzang goes into describing uh, a feature of uh, the, the image that was obviously very peculiar to him. He describes it as a picture where the hand is hanging down, touching the earth. That's what we saw, the earth touching uh, the Bhumi's Barsha Mudra. Uh, and then goes into a short paraphrase at the completely wrong place, because uh, narratively this should be somewhere else. But he obviously feels obliged to give the reader an explanation why uh, the hanging, the, the dropped hand actually is there, because it is the scene when uh, Mara his last attack on the Buddha and said, this is, you are not supposed to sit there, just, just, just go. And the Buddha then says, no, no, the, the famous uh, invoking of the earth goddess, saying, uh, um, the earth goddess uh, is my witness, I am to be enlightened. And now according to this, there's, only, there's not only one earth goddess who pops out and then confirms, there are two. Right? You read the text. Two, uh, two, two, go uh, two goddesses come. One is witnessing, and the other one actually is helping uh, to defeat Mara. Now let's have a look at some of the um, um, of the images which uh, Dennis Leotko uh, in Austin has worked on. He's worked on the uh, on the Bhumi Spasa the Buddhas uh, in the region. Uh, not only the late final ones, which are her favorite, I think, uh, but also on the earlier ones. And you see actually uh, an iconographic pattern emerging exactly at that time we are talking about. So we have uh, the Bhumishpasha Buddhas with two earth deities in Sarnath. They are the oldest, according to Janice, uh, from the 5th century. You see uh, the Buddha in earth-touching gesture, you see figures standing around, and then you have one earth goddess with this kind of arms thrown up and the other one with a vessel in, in her hand, right? So that's, impo that's important now, the vessel. You have the same thing on, uh, uh, on, on the, the next image, on, on the left-hand side, you have the earth deity with the vessel and you have the other one again doing this kind of uh, gesture. Sixth century, and this is now from Bodhgaya directly, uh, you have a pedestal with again an earth goddess with a vessel and uh, another earth goddess doing the same kind of uh, movement. Almost the same here on the right uh, hand side. And these, of course, now are relatively close to uh, a period which you probably would uh, characterize as late Gupta, right? So it's not, it's, it's, it's pre Xuanzang, it's post Fakian. Interestingly, Fakian, the other, uh, the earlier Chinese pilgrim, has nothing to say about uh, the creation of that image. So obviously for him it wasn't relevant. For Xuanzang it was highly relevant, and for uh, all the other followers it was highly relevant as well. So what can we do now with with the matching of the um, of the iconography and the sequence and the storyline and the narratives we have is that probably around the late Gupta period. Uh, an image was created for inside of the Mahab uh, Mahabodhi temple, which showed exactly that iconography which you have here. Yeah, the, God, uh, uh, the earth god. This is, this is, by the way, confirmed by the text. You don't find two earth goddesses in most of the standard Buddha biography. But you find two earth goddesses, or two actions of one earth goddess, in a Chinese translation of the Lalita Vistara, dating from the 4th, 5th century. And you find, find it also in the, um, in the, uh, Four Penti teaching, a Buddha biography, which actually was produced in the Northwest and is dated uh, to the Sui dynasty at the end of the 6th century. So the texts actually confirm quite clearly chronology, which we can gain through the text, through the narratives we have in, in the travelogues and uh, the art historical evidence. So we can actually, if we bring together and contextualize uh, different elements, bring them together, we can certainly create relative chronologies of things that, that we normally wouldn't be able to do. And uh, I think with this, I should uh, stop. The only thing I would like probably to read out is the conclusion. Uh, I hope that I've shown that uh, the two images discussed share some qualities uh, with uh, usual body relics of the Buddha. 
but we are considered a different category from other Buddha images. So the true image uh, here and the, uh, the shadow image. The difference between the two, the shadow and this one, not this one, but in the original one inside of the Mahabodhi temple, is that the Nagarahara shadow is an image projected by the Buddha himself, while the Buddha image was made later and needed justification. It needed uh, uh, authority. And the authority, of course, was given by the fact that it was created by the future Buddha, Maitreya. So it was kind of empowered by the successor, if you like. Who interferes at the place, and we know, by the way, that Maitreya, uh, Maitreya cult was very prominent in that region, because there's also a story about uh, uh, Maitreya sitting in uh, in Tushita Heaven, waiting for the time when he comes down, and uh, the, the disciple of the Buddha, Mahakashyapa, who had received the robe of the Buddha, uh, is sitting in a mountain next to Bodhgaya and is waiting for Maitreya to come down and gives him then the robe uh, as a, trans a sign of transmission of the Dharma. So there is a whole complex uh, around uh, the importance of Bodhgaya as the place of enlightenment, because all Buddhas will reach enlightenment at the same place, Maitreya as well. Is Maitreya becoming involved in the, uh, in, in the, uh, in, in the place? probably linked to the idea of the decline of the Dharma. So because people thought that they were living at a time when the Dharma was not was on decline and that people actually had no uh, direct access to the Dharma, um, miraculous interference was, was important. Um, we can also show, uh, and I can't go into detail, that there obviously was a chrono chronological shift uh, in terms of importance of both images. The shadow probably kind of fell in decline after Xuanzang's visit, because it's never mentioned again, which is indirectly also confirmed by an inscription, which has been found uh, in the region around Bodhgaya by a, uh, a monk from Nagarahara, from the place where the shadow image actually was, who came to Bihar to venerate the true image of the Buddha, and finally became even the abbot of Nalanda Mahavihara, of the great monastery in which Xuanzang and others actually had studied. So there is, in this case, an interesting kind of inscriptional connection where you can speculate how things have shifted. So the shadow was important at some point before the image inside of the Mahabodhi uh, temple became important, and the inscription actually sits in the middle of that kind of shift. It shows that somebody from that place wasn't happy enough about his own place, which had this very famous uh, Buddha shadow, because probably it wasn't important anymore, and moved Bodhgaya to the center of the universe, if you like, to become an abbot there and to stay and venerate the true image of the Buddha. I think with this, with this I should stop.